Hello there, Hero Club. I am Wheelchair21, but you already knew that. And today we're doing another all-new interview. I'm doing this with Soundout12. Greetings and welcome to the interview. Yes, we have an amazing interview guest that we got surprisingly really fast. It is none other than Ultraman Max's and Ultraman Connection's Sean Nichols. Greetings, Earthlings and Aliens, as I always like to say as I start the show on Ultraman Connection. See, I'm yes. uh, properly supporting the cause here. So uh, if you don't know what that is, we'll tell you all about it later. Yeah. Exactly. We will get into that a lot further into our interview. Uh, I'm glad you were able to join us today. I am shocked because I think I tried on Twitter, but then having gone through the other means that I went and contacted you, I was surprised it worked. Yeah, I think, uh, what did we finally get? Like LinkedIn, right? That's yes. how we finally connected. So, yeah. hey. Whatever works, let's so do it. Yeah. If you guys want to do interviews, try there. That's probably the best place if you want to be professional. LinkedIn. Okay. Yes. We are yes. not sponsored by LinkedIn. I just wanted to say it like that. <laughs> Maybe right. soon. You never Maybe. know. Maybe you soon. Never know. Yeah, exactly. That's correct. All right. So I guess we got to start all interviews sort of like at the beginning. Sure. And I got to say, what was your inspiration for wanting to become an actor? Well, it... Uh... It was kind of funny. I originally came to Japan when I was a university student. All right. So I was I was majoring in marketing and international business and uh, at, at Penn State. Um, go Nittany Lions. Yay. Uh, I had to go. You have to study abroad if you're going to be an international business major. Right. And I think a lot of uh, Americans we are like allergic to being bilingual. So most people would either go to London or to Sydney and say, hey, I studied abroad, great. But I was studying business and learning all about Japan and their great bubble economy and how their business practices were the best in the world and how we should all emulate how Japan is doing this. So I thought, well, man, if I learned how to speak Japanese, I could probably have a really good job. So luckily, after I graduated from college, I was able to convince my first job that I spoke enough Japanese to send me to Japan. And so I got to Japan. Um, I was working for the NBA, National Basketball Association. Um, they had just started an office in Japan and I was doing marketing for NBA products. Um, and along the way, I met an, another friend who is another uh, American guy here in Japan who was in a, uh, a talent agency. And he, you know, like me, he had a regular full-time job but on the weekends, he got to do this really cool thing, which was uh, travel around to all the great like tourist spots around Japan and give his opinion as a foreigner about what he thought about these, you know, these great locations around Japan. And I'm like, wow, that's a great job. You get to travel. It's all paid for. And on top of that, you get paid to do it. And you're on TV. And I'm like, hey, if you ever, ever have a chance to have another American go with you on any of these, please call me. And he was like, okay. And so, uh, you know, I don't know, a year passed or something. And one day he called me out of the blue and said, hey, okay, I've got this new show. Uh, they need another uh, foreigner, another American to be on the show. And, you know, you speak Japanese, you're funny. Why don't you try to do it? And I was like, okay, that sounds good. And, you know, I went to the audition and it was, I was a little nervous because I'd never been to an audition before, but I, uh, I I went to the room and it was just a big conference room and the producer was on one side of the table and I'm on the other side of the table. And basically he talked to me for about 15 minutes and didn't really ask me to like read lines or anything like that. And he, he just stood up and said, okay, you're good. You're in. And, and that was it. And so that's how I became an actor. So I started on that one show and uh, because I got accepted to that show, the agency had to take me in right so I was now part of that talent agency and then once you're part of a talent agency they work to try to get you new jobs so I um the next job I had was on NHK which is the big national broadcasting station for for Japan and it was like some kind of English conversation you know tv show and so I did that and then I did another one and then I did another one. And then over the next like three or four years, I had done like nearly every English show that NHK had. Um, and I was also doing, um, th this is kind of, this is kind of strange to think back uh, now, but I was doing uh, 
Japanese stand-up comedy, which they call manzai. I don't know if you've ever heard of manzai before. It's like, it's two people. So it was I me. know a little of it by certain variety shows yeah. and a few Asian import stations. And I only know of it through a, an associate of mine who is our, I, I would say she's technically like our lead translator. Her uh -huh. code name on the, on our site is Toma Kaito. That might ring a bell for you. Totally. Yeah. Uh, and she was living in Japan when you pretty much got your start from what I recall. Oh, she no way. That wow. She saw a lot of your English stuff before yeah. you got the job that we'll talk about, you know, shortly. Interesting. Wow, that's really cool. Um, so, yeah, so so I was doing this Monsai thing, and it was me and this other American guy. So we were like the only foreigners, I don't know, maybe ever, to to do Japanese Monsai um, in Japan. And we were on, you know, a bunch of comedy shows and stuff like that as well. But then um, I got a, an opportunity to audition, and this time it was a real audition, for... Um, a, a a very serious show on NHK. It was a it was a kids show. It was it was a kids show that's on twice a day, so the kids can watch it in the morning before they go to school, and then in the afternoon when they get home from school. And I think ninety nine percent of the kids in Japan were watching it. So I sort of became this like big celebrity amongst kids and moms. All right, and. The reason why I'm telling you this story is that it's very important to how I got the Ultraman gig because uh, one of the producers at Ultraman had a kid who watched that show and he really liked it. And his his dad, the producer said, you know, we've we've never had a foreigner on Ultraman before. This guy would be perfect. Let's let's go out and find him. And so eventually they found me. And they said, would you like to do Ultraman? And I'm like, heck yeah, I would. That was, you know, when I was a kid, that was one of my favorite shows. So, um, you know, they, they called me in, um, met the director, uh, met the, met the other producers and, uh, I got the job that way. And, and there's a really funny story about that too, which we can get into later if you're interested, All right. but yeah, yeah. Cause, uh, ironically, uh, I would like to say you're doing the Kramer effect, uh, we previously introduced, uh, not introduced, we interviewed Steve Kramer, who is a famous voice actor and voice director, mm. ADR guy in America. And he's done it since like the late 70s, uh, early 80s, done yeah. a lot of stuff. And when Sound Out interviewed him, he was answering questions before we even got there. Like he was able to <laughs> narrate a story and give us such a cross. So Sound Out can admit, uh, he's on mute right now, just so I guess we don't yeah. ever talk each other. Right, Sound Out, the Kramer? Yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's wonderful because uh, it, it, it means that our questions were a great start and you're, you're, you're giving us a full you're story. Rolling through, yeah. 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 It's sure. the kind of perfect answer. Uh, if, so, if you ever want to dive into any of those points, just let me know if yeah, you got no, more yeah, questions. Yeah. yeah. Cause we tried to do as best uh, chrono in chronological order, but we're glad that you're able to do this so we can build off of it later. Cause I, mm -hmm. I was going to ask before we get to the uh, Ultraman max role, uh, yeah. like what was your earliest experiences actually moving into uh, Japan or moving over to Japan or, in general because mm -hmm. like you said like learning japanese is obviously difficult or just being american and wanting to learn another language yeah. was so how was the integration process like just understanding the culture and what right. just moving around like what was that like for you yeah um it was okay so when i when i went to the study abroad it was like my uh, first semester of my senior year of university and you know I, I had only been abroad like one time before in my life. I went to Europe on a trip, um, but um, I was really excited. You know, I I studied a little bit of Japanese before I went, but it was like nothing. I like what I got when I got to Japan. I was like, oh my god, I can't even I can't even properly ask where the bathroom is. You know, it was really funny. But I I must say that uh, I got here. Um, I lived with a homestay family. Uh, in Kyoto, actually, and uh, they were great. Uh, I mean, they didn't they didn't speak any English, <laughs> but they accepted me wholeheartedly as one of the family, and I learned my Japanese just from them, just being around them, just being immersed in it. I carried around this little tiny pocket dictionary, so when they said a word that I didn't know, I would look it up and be like, oh, okay, I got it. And then I'd reply to them. And when I wanted to say something to them, I didn't know, I would look it up. And 
you know, maybe you don't learn everything the first time or the second time, but usually by the third time you're hearing something or you're saying something, it starts to become ingrained, right? And I think Japanese, and maybe like anything, do you know about the, you know, the 80-20 rule, right? You use 20% of the language 80% of the time. So you end up finding that you're saying the same kind of things over and over again. And just by learning that first 20%, you can deal with 80% of the situations out there. So after, you know, after only three months of living with this family, I was basically communicating in Japanese. I wouldn't say I was fluent, but I was good enough to like basically get by in every kind of typical uh, family situation and, uh, and, and have fun. And, you know, I still talk to the family uh, even today, when I go to Kyoto for a visit, I always stop by and say hi. And, you know, they're all doing great. And we all have a, amazing memories of our time together. Yeah. All right. Uh, before I pass it over to Sana to ask a few questions, I, I got this one. Uh, do you have any funny stories about Japanese residents ever confusing you for being a tourist or another known celebrity before I guess you became more prominent on children's <laughs> programming and the NHK programming. Like, did you ever have that one where they like look at you and go, wait, oh, you know the language? Oh, you, you've been here for yeah, a while? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think Japanese people in general uh, make assumptions when they see foreigners that they don't speak Japanese. So uh, a lot of times they'll, I'll be speaking Japanese to them, but they're expecting English. So they're not even, their brain isn't even switched on to like hear Japanese. So I'm speaking to them in just normal Japanese and they're like, I'm sorry, what did you say? And I'm like, dude, I'm speaking to you in Japanese. <laughs> just listen to me, everything will be fine. Um, and yeah, and sometimes people um, would mistake me for other foreigner celebrities. Like uh, I was in a hotel the same hotel that a Japanese baseball team was staying in. And on every Japanese baseball team, you can have, I think, up to three foreigners on the team as well. And so when I would walk in, all the fans would be there because they were expecting like Ichiro or something because Ichiro was on that team. But they would think I was like the, the guy, the, the foreign guy on the team. And they'd come up to me and be like, oh, can I have your autograph? Can you introduce me to Ichiro? All this stuff. So that was kind of funny. Um, I, of course, gave them my autograph, but as Sean. <laughs> so they probably like, they're thinking they got the autograph of some baseball player. But when they get home, they're going to be like, oh, Sean Nichols? That's not who I thought I was getting in the autograph of. Yeah. So a bunch of people out there are like, wait, the guy from Ultraman Max? What? <laughs> well, no, that was that was well, that's before, before, before. But yeah. like nowadays, they're looking back. If they didn't throw oh, it out, if they didn't throw it out, they're like, oh, Oh, it's him. Yeah. Oh, man. Like, I'm pretty sure there has to be like some person who was a baseball fan and an Ultraman fan. Who, Somebody like, out there got that cool. autograph, realized you weren't on the team, threw it out a couple yeah. of years later, see you on their television. And they're just like, why? <laughs> why did why did I do this? Yeah. Why? But but yeah, it happens a lot. It does. It does. OK, so you had mentioned uh, that you had seen Ultraman prior to uh, auditioning for Max. Uh, what was your like overall knowledge of the Ultra series uh, going into that like audition process? Yeah, well, OK, so when I was a kid in the U.S., it was on TV. Um, so I definitely watched it there. Um, it was it was kind of funny. The, the, the Ultraman show would start as soon as school was, the, the minute the school ended. So I had to like run home really fast to watch it. Um, so I never really got to watch the opening the opening uh, theme or hear the opening theme or watch that. So it was always kind of funny to hear that um, because I never got to see it. But when I got to Japan, I had like realized, oh man, yeah, Ultraman is a real big thing here. And I remember as a kid, I used to watch that all the time. So it kind of got me back into it a little bit. And it was kind of it was kind of cool to see Ultraman again. Um, yeah, I don't know if I don't know if you guys know this, but there were some like rights issues, some global rights problems that caused uh, Tsuburaya to not be able to show Ultraman um, outside of Japan for something. And, and because of that, no one in the U.S. got to see it for a long, long time. Um, which is why I'm really glad all those rights issues got solved and now we're back to uh, being able to 
um, roll it out for all the fans in the U.S. again. Um, but anyway, that's uh, that's where I learned about it. And then when I got back to Japan, like I said, I figured out, oh, well, this is actually a big thing. And there's, you know, every every year there's a new Ultraman hero that that comes out. And, you know, because for me, I only think I watched like the original Ultraman. I think that was the only show that they had. So I didn't even know that there was like this whole series of different Ultraman. So I remember getting a book and like, oh, there's Ultra Seven and there's Taro and then there's Ace, you know, and there's all these other Ultraman that I didn't even know about. Um, so that was pretty much the extent that I knew about it. And I just knew it had a really, uh, you know, like, strong place in my heart from watching it when I was a kid and how much I really liked it. So um, that was, that was my, you know, I, there, there was this, there was a series of three shows in a row. It started with Ultraman. Then it had um, Johnny, Johnny Sacco, I think is his name. Yeah, Do you know uh, that? Johnny Sacco was the giant American, Robo? yeah, American adaptation of Giant Robo. The, giant uh, Robo, yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, anime yeah. or whatever, or manga it was, I think. Yeah, and then there was then, also Goldar Battle Battle of the Planet something, which was uh, Ambassador Magma, which was a token uh, okay. that we had here next to them. Cool. Unless and then and, and then after that was Speed Racer, yep. right? So uh, there was like three Japanese shows on in a row, and I had no idea they were Japanese. You know, I'm just a kid like watching this That's, stuff, and it's all so cool. You know, it's the Voltron effect. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, and then and then it kind of like all sort of faded out, and I didn't know why, but you know there's a hundred other things to watch on TV. So I had kind of forgotten about it, but until I got back to Japan and saw it again, I was like really, really, uh, you know, surprised at how big of an IP it was in Japan. Yeah. Yeah. What's funny is uh, I'm one of those nineties kids that had the luxury of seeing the very rare uh, seven dub because seven, we had a mm -hmm. North American dub for seven. There was like two dubs. There was the Hawaiian dub. Then there was like a Canadian special broadcast that like, I think Turner Broadcasting had bought and mm -hmm. distributed in America. And we had that on early TNT, like in the late eighties and nineties. So I had yeah. seen seven. Then I discovered Ultraman later on, a little later on. And we also had Tiga get brought over. I already knew who Tiga was because of Godzilla followers, but we didn't get Tiga till like the two thousands. And I knew about Tiga, like maybe 99. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then after tiga it was just like and i think i probably saw like one rare airing of uh kane kosogi's uh ultraman yeah. towards the future or powered i think they call powered, it yeah, yeah, yeah. In, uh -huh. uh, in japan versus america where he's like called the ultimate hero or towards the future i get uh -huh. i get great and powered's like subtitled or prefix all i always switch them around i can never mm -hmm. remember the the exact title but yeah i think i saw kane's ultraman once as a kid and then I was just like, I want more injected into my veins. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 really cool. Um, and then and then you know once you're in Japan, then you can watch it. It's it's on TV all the time, and um, and now it's on you know social media. You got it on YouTube. You could check out. I mean, there's so many there's so many more opportunities to watch it now. You're forgetting the other major thing. If you live in Japan, you have Subaraya Imagination, uh, its own too. streaming service. Yes, yes. We got to yes. plug everything we can. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. But yeah, you can't, you can't get that. Have you, have you tried to like VPN into Japan to try you to know, watch it? We haven't, we have not tried that and we should sound out. We should try to see I, if we I can probably, do I'm, I'm the one that has all the tech to get yeah. all the news sources. Cause like Bandai has been locking their websites out, like region locking oh, it. I'm like, I right. want to look at Super Rai Imagination. <laughs> like we, <laughs> we've watched, we've watched the legal route for like the movie since they've done that through Ultimate Connection. Like we all together uh, did a group watching of episode Z for uh, the, what was it? The, oh, the trigger movie. Tri yeah, the trigger movie. Yeah. Me, yeah. I'm like, who was that guy? He was just on, <laughs> man, that's bad. <laughs> That is so bad that I forgot Trigger already. Maybe it's not because America. It's a weird thing. <laughs> it's... Yeah, I mean, I mean the the Ultraman Connection events have been great for, yes. for watching stuff like the. I remember the uh, the one for the the Destin Crossroad it was like such this long epic. Yes, that we, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. We, that we got Destin Crossroads before Japan did. Yeah, in its that entirety. Was cool. We were just like, okay, okay. Okay, can we can we can we just pause for a minute? Nope, more action. 
yeah yeah yeah. yeah it was it was a funny little war broke out on social media where it was like the american fans were being told by the japanese fans don't spoil dustin crossroad and the the american fans are telling the japanese fans don't tell us about shin ultraman <laughs> yes. uh, yeah so so sada i guess you ask the next question all right, so uh, so we've talked a lot about Ultraman, um, but in terms of like the broader Tokusatsu world, uh, how how much have you dabbled into you know looking into other like Tokusatsu such as Kamen Rider or Super Sentai or anything in between? Yeah, so you know Kamen Kamen Rider, of course, I I know because that's a you know that's that's another huge one. Um, you know when when Ultraman kind of went away from me as a kid. Um, Godzilla sort of took over. Now, does that count as Tokusatsu? It should, right? It does, right? Well, yeah, I, I count it. it I count it because it, 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 it some people try to like separate kaiju from Tokusatsu, but like Ultraman's yeah. there in the middle. So it's like just put it all under Tokusatsu. Well, okay. you, yeah, you, you he is technically the godfather of Tokusatsu. AG worked on Godzilla. Yeah, he, AG did he most of those stunt it. stunts, props, and all that even before Godzilla was made. So it's Tokusatsu. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, he he's the like you said he's the grandfather of tokusatsu so and it started with godzilla so you know back the back then you know those like sort of original godzilla movies they would show those every once in a while too on on us tv so that was always like a huge thing when those were on i would always always make an appointment to watch those you know i mean like like this is you know this is before uh you know ott services there was no streaming there was barely cable you know no no vtr you know you can record anything so you had to be in front of the tv at that moment to watch it and uh it was uh you know a, a different era of course but it, it made it all that much more special right yeah here's a quick question uh when you went to japan was that in the 90s right yeah i was in i came in 94 Okay, so you uh, yeah. you were around during the early sci-fi channels, like oh my god, Zilla marathons, right? You remember those? Yes, exactly. Those were great. Yeah. Those were great all summer long. Oh my god, I'm still like looking for bumpers. I, like every time I find them, they always delete them off YouTube, and I'm like, they're commercials. They're not yeah. copyrighted material. They're I know. You gotta save I know. Those. But you know, people are starting to come around. I think you know, at first, especially in Japan, there was this big sort of like anti um youtube sort of you know yeah. oh we can't let our we can't let our ip out there for free oh my god but i think people are now starting to realize that that's an amazing way to let people know about your ip and mm -hmm. to get them more involved and to, and to increase the the fandom so it, it, it's it took a while for japan to realize that you know if you have good ip sometimes you should just let it let it go, let it be free and control it inside your channel. And that way, um, you know, all the fans will come there and then you can then control the message of what you send to the fans. That's what's the most important thing, I think. Yeah, that, Super Raya really got that learning curve. They they knew what to do yeah. right at the time. They like they switched that on because I see a lot of times that Super Raya, they don't attack content creators like, I, I don't want to be a jerk, but Toei, Toei loves, oh, yeah. Toei loves attacking the mm -hmm. Western fan base. They they love well. They love attacking their own fan base, even in the home audience on social media. They yep. they think everything is, you know, copyright this, copyright that, not fair use. It's a product. They they think a product review now isn't fair use. Uh, yeah, yeah I've, like, I've had I've had issues with Toei where it's like, hey, you're using the sounds from our show, and I'm like, no, I bought the toy, and I'm doing a video on the toy, and the toy has yeah. the sounds from the show. <laughs> yeah, I mean. But, but I've had never I've never had issues with Subaraya, and I think that yeah. to that point they've 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 sort of changed the game by just having Ultraman weekly on YouTube. It's just reached such a huge audience because it's like anyone can just go on YouTube and it's like mm -hmm. you know, I can recommend people Ultraman Decker and they can just go watch the episodes and it, yeah. it yeah, yeah. takes down the barriers of entry and I think it really helps exactly just continue to to make everything grow just as long as we refer people to go watch an ultraman series that doesn't have any contributions by johnny and associates yes <laughs> exactly you know that particular one that really good one yeah yeah, yeah. They, they are uh they're a powerful group that's for sure they are they, but they, they are do, very they powerful they protect they protect themselves oh yeah so. i remember someone just did a, a thing about explaining 
uh, how Johnny and Associates are very protective of their IPs. And yeah. Johnny still hit them for just discussing how they protect their IPs. It was like an actual thing where someone was doing, not attacking them, not just an unbiased like explanation on how well they do it, how their legal yeah. works. And they still copywrote the guy. And he was like, what? What happened? <laughs> Well, a good a good friend of mine here in Japan um, actually works for for Johnny's now, and his his role is to increase the presence of their uh, not their top tier but their their lower tier artists on social media specifically. So they are let's say they're taking a really big first step, not with the huge guys, but with their with their um, their lower level artists and some of them are now becoming more popular than some of the top tier just because of what they're doing so I, I think they will also learn eventually too what what this fandom can do if you just kind of let yeah them they're, they're testing the waters with i guess the young blood the ones that are more yeah. modern hip you know they can't they can't just go out there and go yo here's v6 oh wait they broke up here's smap yeah. oh wait they broke up yeah which yeah. is funny because the only reason i knew who i think is it snap or smap Smap, yeah, Map. with an M. The only reason I knew who they were was unfortunately because one of the members is Tricera Ranger from Ju Ranger. Uh huh. Yes, yes. And yeah. I only, and the only two reasons I know V Six is because Tiga mm -hmm. and I think Inuasha. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. They did the opening. They they've do, done other yeah, animes. They've, they've 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 done a good job of like getting outside of just music and trying to do you know not just tokusatsu but like even real real acting on various you know tv shows and movies so it's it, they're they're trying to spread their wings a little bit not just be boy bands so to speak boy bands who can also act <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. all right so i think our next block of questions uh yeah, is the, about ultraman max yeah okay. yeah it's the so one I'm, where... I'm gonna pass it over to my co-host for this okay this <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, because I'm the one who actually watched the show. I yeah, haven't I, seen all of it yet. I'm waiting know, for it to I get re, re licensed so I can watch it officially. Yeah. If, <laughs> if, if, it's coming if soon, I hear. I've heard the rumors. Uh, yeah, Mill Creek movie. apparently said it's coming out on DVD before the end of the year. So I'm like, cool, I can <laughs> watch if, next. If you want to hear a great backstory, Sean, this is this is how to explain it. Sound out got in during like the X boom on Crunchyroll, right? When they really started doing the Simon cast. Yeah. I've been here since the old days of torrenting and pirating in the fan sub. Mm -hmm. I was, I think I was watching Max probably during Mabius or Ultra 7X because this is back when Crunchyroll was just the more otaku version of YouTube before it became mm -hmm. an actual license. Yeah, people over here don't re remember this, but Crunchyroll started out as like Kiss Asia level. Like they were just like a YouTube, they were just, people were uploading pirated stuff up there. And then they were like, you know what, let's actually buy licensing and become a real streaming. And now look at them, they're big. Yeah. But uh, I was, amazing. I'm from yeah. the good old days of fans. If they really wanted to watch their tokusatsu, they were translating it and providing it for other fans who didn't have the time or the luxury to do so. Mm -hmm. And when Max came out, like, I saw that while I was like in that transition of like middle school and high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm still old as crap. <laughs> but I'm I'm from that era. Like I'm from cool. the old era of the we had yeah. to bootleg it. But uh yeah, so since we're talking about that, you briefly were discussing about how you got the audition was because a member of uh Subaraya was like, yo, we, we should do this. We haven't really had a, a main uh yeah. I guess you would say uh gaijin or you know non Asian mm -hmm. uh actor in the show. So what was the actual whole audition like because they came to get you so that means you pretty much had the job practically they pretty much were like take it it's yours so yeah it, well, like? so, okay so the first guy to reach out to me uh just just to get the story exactly straight it was not a tsuburaya guy it was um the the japanese tv channel um the uh the terrestrial tv channel it's called tbs but it's not the t it's not turner broadcasting it's tokyo broadcasting system and uh, the producer was from TBS, uh, and so he was the one that originally contacted me. So I went in to meet with him. Um, we had a, we had a really good meeting. He was a great guy, and he's like, "Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell Tsuburaya to um, meet with you, and you know, tell them like, hey, we should really do this.'" So he convinced them to do it, and so they so he said, "Okay, all they want to do is they want you to um, go meet the director." 
he wants to make sure you speak Japanese, that you can actually act, that you can, you know, do the the physical things that you need to do. And I'm like, okay, sure, that's all right, I'll do that. Um, so I went into this so-called audition. Now, I know before I kind of uh, had a really easy audition where it was just me and this the director and it was over 15 minutes. But when I got to the place at Subaraya Studios where I was supposed to go, I walked into a room of 30 other Japanese actors who were auditioning for this role. And I was like, wait a minute, this isn't what we discussed. And my heart just sank. And I was like, oh no, I thought I had this role wrapped up and now I've got to do like a proper audition. And I was like, crap, crap, crap. I was so excited. And now I'm like back to square one. But I, you know, I, 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 I took a number and, you know, all the people get a number and they stick it on there because they call you by your number, not your name. And, you know, when they called my number, they said, OK, go in. And I, I there was a whole lineup of, you know, directors and producers and, you know, executives from Tsuburaya all there. And, you know, they gave me some lines to read. Um, and it was funny because this character had already been written um, and it wasn't for a foreigner. It was it was a guy named Tabata, Tabata Tain, you know, so was the was the guy's name. So I'm reading Tabata lines, you know, and I'm trying to look like, okay, like so, but if I'm foreigner, how would I read this? Because obviously I'm not Tabata, you know, look at my face. I can't be Tabata. So um anyway, I just went with the flow. I did what I was told, like a like a, you know, a good respectful boy would. And uh they called me back in again and I did some more scenes with some other people. Um, you know, like as a group to see how you, you know, play off other people. And then um, the funny thing they do at Japanese auditions a lot is they'll have the whole group there in a room waiting. And then they'll come back and they'll say, if you hear your number, you can go home. So basically, if you hear your number, that's it. You you didn't you didn't make it. So I'm sitting in the room with everybody. And then like one by one, they keep calling people's numbers. And I, I'm still there. And then finally, uh, it was me and this other guy who were there. And I'm like, oh, what does this mean? And uh, so they chose me. I, and I think it was I think it was set up. I think what I heard later was that they had already called for the audition. So they couldn't tell people not to come. But they had already decided behind the scenes that I was going to get the role. And then the other guy there was the role of uh, uh, Koba. You know, you remember Koba from Max? He was like the... He was like the guy with two guns. He was like the gun, the gun guy. And anyway, yeah, um, so I, it's funny. I I can't. I couldn't remember it until like you just said. Oh, it's the other, the other guy. Like yeah. that you were mostly partnered with with the exactly. I'm like exactly. I'm like Koba. I'm like, does he? Yeah. You mentioned two guy? guns. I've been watching Ace recently, and there's a guy with two guns in that one too. So yeah. my brain just getting a whole different person in my head right now. <laughs> it, it's sad because what I what I remember Max the most, and this is this is gonna sound bad especially for Koba's actor. I, I I remember him being there, but I'm like, yeah. there's Sean, there's Ellie, there's, yeah. there's ha, ha, you know, Hito, Hitomi Hasebe, right? Uh, yeah, Hitomi, Hitomi. Yeah, Hitomi. I'm like, there's because I've seen her in other stuff. I'm like, there's Matsuda from Death Note. And everyone's like, yeah. what do you, I always, because it was weird, because I just got finished watching Max, and then they announced the Death Note movie, and I'm just like, like, what? What's going on? Why? Yeah, why, yeah, why yeah. is Ultraman Max and Kamen Rider? Be, uh, and I remember the captain, and I remember like Ellie, and then every alumni actor from Ultraman. Yeah, and I'm like, right. I'm like, I can't. Like, I just remember your two guns. Like, yeah, the two how, guns. Like, guy. And, and, on, yeah, and usually I can remember names, but it's like as I've gone on certain shows, like it's just like I can only remember like gimmicks or the actor's actual name. And yeah, I'm just yeah, like, yeah. Two guns. <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean it was it was a great cat i mean like like we're not to the cast yet but um it, it was it was amazing but anyway so anyway end of the day audition I, I got the role um and and that's how it all that's how it all came together now as i can recall and and my staff we we worked hard to try to remember this uh obviously you're one of the most gaijin characters with an ultraman series there's been other foreigners as like reoccurring or yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the typical, as we like to call it, not so foreign, where they the, it's obviously, you know, someone who actually is either Japanese, but they either are playing at a foreigner or someone who is at least mm -hmm. maybe part Japanese and part something something else. But for you, obviously, you are like like us. The, and, and it's in the name, too, Sean White, like the whitest. Yes. It's like like it's make me think of the old comedy show, The Whitest Guy. You know, it's like he, like him. Um, yes. 
with your inclusion. Well, I mean, but 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 it's funny. So on that name, right? Like I said, it was it was Tabata up until the audition. So then when I when I got the role, they were like, "Oh my gosh, we need to change the name." And like, well, okay, his name is Sean. Let's just call him Sean. And for a last name, well, White. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. I don't think there was much more thought yeah, other than that. Because so. when I was a teenager, I. When I watched Max, I had like this weird thing where I was like, man, this is really weird. Like I and like it was a part of my my on screen persona where it was like when I would have asked me about Max, I would be like, just don't talk to me about Sean. White. <laughs> like it was like one of those because I was like, I was like, yes, let's make the white guy the most weirdest out of, of place character. Yeah, yeah. I was like, just don't just no, just we'll, like because it was just so weird as a teenager. But then as I've gotten older, I'm like, eh, it's not that bad. <laughs> like that's like, but um. I was going to ask, uh, were you, in a sense, treated slightly different? Like, what was the in uh, inclusion? Like, did you feel, like, a bit more honored knowing, like, you were this going to be this character, like, for once being, yeah. know, well, you know, you know at Japanese? the time, at the time I started, I don't think anyone made a big deal that, like, this is the first time um, a foreigner's ever been in it. But as we were shooting it and we were doing like, you know, PR and being interviewed by, you know, other magazines and things like that. Then people started asking me about it and like, Oh, what does it feel like to be the first foreigner ever to have a regular role on Ultraman? It's like, Oh, wow. That's, that's really cool. Uh, there's a lot of responsibility now for me. So I, uh, you know, I tried to, you know, take it seriously and live up to the task and, you know, it, and there hasn't really been another one, you know, since then. So it, I don't know if I, if I broke the mold or ruined it or whatever, but uh, anyway, it's just kind of, it, it's, it's kind of cool to be like that, that, like that one and only to, to be doing that. So um, it's, it, you know, it makes me really happy. And even to this day to kind of be the, the face of Ultraman now that we're relaunching it in the U S is just another really great moment for me. And it just makes me so proud. You know, it, it takes me back to those, you know, 15, 16 years ago when we were doing Ultraman Max and to see people who have loved the show from them come out of the woodwork that I, you know, never seen before. And then now that it's going to be coming out again, um, you know, hopefully, like we said, before the end of this year, I, I think it's going to just, you know, be another great hit because I mean, obviously I'm so biased but it's a great series. I mean, it's got everything you want. It's got all the old characters coming back, all the old kaiju coming back. Um, it's got great directors. You know, we had, uh, you know, uh, Mieke, uh, who is like one of the best Japanese directors in the history of, of Japanese cinema to come and direct two episodes of the show. Um, and, and arguably they're the two best episodes ever in the entire Ultraman series. Now, maybe you guys have something to say about that. I, like I said, I'm, I'm totally trying to remember, biased. I'm trying but... to remember which ones his episodes were because I I always get confused if he directed the now Nagasawa episodes or if he directed other ones. I always, because the sad part is, is the wiki is sometimes they forget to include on the English side who directed uh, which episodes. Yeah. And on the wiki, they try to credit that uh, Takashi uh did all of it they they try to credit that he did all of max when he didn't he only did like two or three yeah. episodes he only two two episodes uh the way i promote max to a lot of people uh because for me i i find it very weird at times because it does do, do a lot of homage to q and ultraman but then it mm -hmm. also tries to have a very uh traditional modern uh story arc also uh added to it but it gets kind of uh disjointed so i i always yeah. try to say Ultraman Max is like the equivalent of Masters of Horror, which is ironic because uh, Takashi also did like an episode or two for the anthology series Masters of Horror. Because when you watch a lot of Max, some episodes are very disjointed by yeah. like how old Ultra Q was, where it was just reoccurring anthologies with the same cast of characters, but nothing really over arcs except ex specific episodes. So I always explain to people that for some people it might be a little jarring, but it also feels, um, you know, familiar. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't know if you recall, but at the time, Ultraman had kind of taken a um, a very like serious or dark turn before Matt's. Right. Yep. And I think that had caused a lot of the the younger fans to sort of be like, hey, maybe this isn't for me. I think some of the older fans liked it. Yes. But so there I was, was a I was actually influenced a lot by 
the uh, Project N. Uh, Project N really uh, reinvigorated my like love already that I had. Like I had Tiga, and then I mm -hmm. had I got Ultraman Next and Nexus, and I was actually very disgruntled that uh, they canned it and they were not continuing with the whole project. Yeah, yeah. It, there was a lot. I remember. I remember a lot of discussion about that. And, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, they they cast me was because I was previously on that kids show for three years that, you know, all the all the kids in Japan were watching. So, you know, maybe that sort of reinvigorated the, the youth to start watching it again, too, was was the idea. And, you know, we were definitely I mean, we had our kind of dark episodes, but we were definitely not afraid of being quirky or being funny or you know doing something outlandish which which i think adds to it a lot you know i i think if ultraman takes itself too seriously sometimes yeah. it uh that's when they start kind of people the, the fan base starts getting polarized right um and but i don't know maybe 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 being quirky also polarizes it too I'm yeah because sure. when i was a teenager like max was very polarizing for me when i was like becoming a teenager when it was airing right. and i was just kind because of, that also at the time it didn't help that um some of the showa show series that were very nonsensical as well as dinah weren't fully fan subbed and unavailable mm -hmm. on the sites that i was going to that i wasn't aware of like some of the more zanier episodes of the ultra series so i had tiga which its comedy wasn't so abundant like it was there but it wasn't like in your face like nutty and i also had like gaia which would have like some slapstick and some humor here and there but it always felt like in the moment mm -hmm. And then when you watch Max, sometimes there are there are a lot of comedy episodes to the extent where, like I say, uh, some episodes do feel slightly disjointed because some episodes your protagonist in uh, in uh, Toma Kaito, which yeah. is ironic because that's where Toma got her name from, our translator. Um, yeah. He sometimes they try to play him up as sort of like the modern day Hayata, but then mm -hmm. an episode later, he's like hit the hard reset button. And he doesn't know how like an elevator works. Now I know that doesn't actually happen in the show, but there's episodes where like he doesn't know how to like formulate what's going on. And yeah. what I find funny, which is more endearing, is that um, Mizuki is probably one of the best written characters in the show. Um, mm. I think she is one of the strongest characters in the show. And I, that that also goes to the, the fact that I always say this a lot. Subaraya really knows how to write their women. They know how to write like really badass women because you have uh, the commander from Tiga, you have Nagi from Nexus, you have yep. Mizuki, and even Ellie to some extent when she has her character episodes, she does some quirky but also serious stuff of like being pretty much the data of. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, but yeah. the women women are written really good. Like the Max women are like some of the best women actually written. I think at all yeah. time. That's like my favorite thing about Max is that they're written really good. Yeah, yeah. The the women were the the you know the the rock really. They were the the smart the smartest ones on the team. They they were the ones that you could depend on, whether it's Ellie being like the robot uh, or, or Mizuki being, you know, sort of like the, the very um, strong and determined. And, you know, uh, like if they ever did a remake of Max, she would definitely be the one that became the, the captain, right, of the, of the group next time. So hopefully we can do that with her. She's yeah, a- It's great. It's just, it's just great. She really like holds the show down. I, yeah, I, yeah. I forget there's like one episode where I think she even stops like and they do like one of those fourth wall things where she like just stops and looks at the camera and goes I can't handle these guys anymore I hate all yeah, of them exactly. like it's I think, yeah. I think adding to that uh, I think it's what helps with Ultraman's broader appeal is that it has there's more lighthearted series there's more serious series it has uh, strong written characters both male and female and so I think that like and it, what it sounds like is that Max is like one of the shows that kind of blends both styles has has its lighter moments with its darker moments but yeah. uh and i think that that hopefully like because I, I know some people um just from talking to different people who've been getting into ultraman recently um mm -hmm. some prefer the more serious shows like taiga or like ultra 7x or nexus whereas others prefer the lighter hearted ones such as the showa era and knocked mm -hmm. over chuck 
I failed. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I found um, out. Don't, don't take out your aggression on, on Sean. <laughs> I don't have any aggression. Uh, and, and some people didn't like Ultraman Rube, for example, a couple years back mm -hmm. because it was more lighthearted. Um, so I think the the thing, the, the question I, I, I kind of came up with on the fly was that, um, do you think that that, you know, would you agree that that's what helps Ultraman's like broad appeal is the fact it can go through those different styles and tones and genres within its shows? Oh, I totally, I think so. hundred percent. And, you know, we, I, I earlier said that, uh, you know, the Mieke who, who directed those two episodes, um, his two episodes are about as different as two episodes can be. Now I, I know you haven't watched it yet, so I, I encourage you to, to check them out when you do but one of his one of his episodes is uh is this amazing like tearjerker i mean it it will make you cry i mean literally it's like the only ultraman that that makes everyone uh shed a tear um and then the other one he does is just this slapstick comedy and it's it, it'll, it just has you roaring in laughter. So, you know, and these episodes are one after the other. So, I mean, I guess one man's disjointedness is another man's, you know, homage to the the past and the future and, and all these different things that Ultraman can be. So it's, uh, it's really cool. And uh, anyone who's watching this, if you haven't seen the Mieke ones, make sure you go back and watch those two episodes. Here's a question real fast, just to yeah. try to verify without spoiling it for sound out. I'm trying to narrow it down in my mind of which one it could be. Is it yeah. the one with the flute monster? The evolving yeah. flute. Okay. Yes. That's, okay. That's that, the first one. That evolving flute monster one, I think, has some of the best fights next to like the Luganoger fight. Mm, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Like that that weird flute hybrid evolution monster, like it almost won. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I will also add uh talking talking about Mike is uh his films his zebra man films were very much like they were the slapstick comedy and also like the seriousness in yes, a lot of yeah. ways at that same time i think it's just like he has kind of two styles and so it's, it's nice right. to hear that you got to apply both to ultraman yeah, as opposed exactly. to just doing one since we keep bringing up uh Takshi Mike, uh I, I guess i want to ask and I also referenced it earlier, since I like to call it sometimes the Masters of Horror. What was it like working with all the guest directors and like guest script writers that were brought in for the show? Because I know uh, Shizuke Kaniko, who's worked on Godzilla mm -hmm. and Gamera. I feel like there's a few other guys. Or just I, I, I remember those two names off the top of my head because I've seen their filmography. But I do remember yep. there were other guest uh, people involved with yeah. the show, which could explain yeah. why, for me as a teenager, it was so disjointed just trying to process at all right. because it was like one guy came in and he completely didn't want to do what the rest of the team was doing yeah i think um you know anytime you have like 50 episodes to get through in a year it, it's hard you know uh, one one director first of all physically cannot do that right there's just too much work pre-production and post-production to do so what they would do is they'd have a new director every two episodes okay and they were kind of like the the Tsuburaya directors, you know, who would kind of repeat and come back um, again. And then there was uh, Kaneko-san, who was sort of, he was supposed to be like the overall director. And then there was the sort of overall like creator slash producer, also director, um, this uh, a guy named Yagi, Yagi-san. And, you know, he's, it, it's really, it's really his heart and soul. Uh, that 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 gave birth to to Max. So I think I think the the Yagi san was sort of the guy who took over Max and said, "Look, we need to stop this darkness. We need to bring out new uh, a more uh, like like a more homage approach." Because we were also the fortieth series, right, to come out. So there was something you know there as well. So it's like let's take all the best parts from the from the past bring them to the, the the present and then add like all these new elements of society, you know, like, okay, there's a foreigner here. There's now we have really strong women, um, you know, a, a robot, you know, all these kind of new sort of things like he kind of put into Max himself. So, so between, between Yagi, uh, Kaneko, um, and then the guest directors like Mieke and then uh, Misoji, who is, 
one of the original directors back in the in the uh, the original series. He came back for a guest um, turn for two episodes as well. So um, yeah, it was really cool to work with them all. I mean, on one hand, every time it's a new director and it's like, okay, how does this director like to work? And you kind of have to, you know, feel your way into how they 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 do their job. Um, but on the other hand, it's it's great to get, you know, to work with so many different people, to to learn how different directors work was, was great too. Um, but you're right, sometimes they would tell you to do something that you know, wait a minute, my character would never do this. You know, this is kind of weird. So you, you know, sometimes you could have that discussion. You could be like, you know, I don't think Sean would do this because up until now he's been like this. So for him to do it now would be really weird. Sometimes they listen to you. Sometimes they don't, <laughs> to be honest with you. Sometimes they just say, just do it. And I'm like, okay, fine. Um, but you know, a lot of times they'll, they'll have that discussion with you. And if you make a good point, they'll listen to you and they'll, they'll change it up. All right. So we just had to take a break to discuss the multiverse and it was great. We thought it was nonsensical. It, it wasn't worth being included in the interview because we were just like, let's just, let's just throw out ideas and see if any, anything that hits the dartboard actually sticks with what Tsuburaya is planning in the next 10 years. Hmm. For all we know. What do, you, what, what do you think? Do you think, uh, do you think we uh, came up with some good ideas or? Oh yeah. I, I think, know. I think they were great. Cause we're just like, right. just, we just gotta, I think the best way to summarize our, our conversation that people didn't get to hear was we said, just so, like either condense the continuity, you can still keep the multiverse, but you don't have to keep shoehorning it. Just it yeah, doesn't, yeah, doesn't exactly. Need be, it doesn't need to be necessary. Do it lightly. Sprinkle yes. it in, and then yeah. do the big crossovers every so often. Right, right, yeah. right. That's the best way. To yep. Do it. Cool. So, yeah. Keep, keeping that essence of Ultraman, I think, is the key, and yeah. the, the other stuff is just sort of like window dressing, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Where are we now? The next couple of questions for Max related was uh, after you were cast. Uh, I know in Japan, sometimes there's like bonding exercises or like sometimes they'll do like mm -hmm. maybe like a, a one week retreat or a two week retreat to sort of get the cast acquainted. Were you, was anything like that going on or were you just like all just thrown in together and goes, you're filming, start acting, do your scenes? Like how did yeah. it work to get introduced to your co-stars on the show? Well, I remember the, the very first day that we all got together as a team, um, they sent us all into into a room uh, just to wait. And, you know, I'm sitting there with with, with, with the whole cast, you know, it, it's me and, and Sota and Hitomi and uh, Kai, Kai san who's, you know, Hijikata, the Taicho, and then Ellie's there and, and Koba's there. And we're all just sitting there and nobody's saying a thing. And I'm like, oh, my God, I am not going to be like this for the next year of my life. So I said, all right, look, guys, I know none of us have really met before, but let's just all break the ice right now. Everyone go around the room. Tell me where you're from, what your favorite th color is, what your favorite song is and and, and where and, 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 and like where you want to go in the world. And then we just sort of had this like kind of like icebreaker. And then after that, we all became like instant friends. And it's lasted even till this day. All of us, we all get together and we just, I don't know, it was a really good working experience for everyone. You know, we, it's very intense, you know, because you spend like all day together, you know, for months at a time. And, um, you know, you're not always, you're not always on the set, you're waiting. And so you're waiting with other people. And so you get to, you get to become friends and you get to have these really strong relationships. So um, it was, it was great. We bonded um pretty much instantly um i'm glad i was the one to break the ice because i don't know if it ever would have been broken if i didn't do something but um it it ended up being you know probably the best thing to happen on the whole show i'm pretty sure your castmates at the time were like wait he knows english like some, someone probably had to not recognize you it was like wait what what's going on well, yeah, I know. I think, you know, everyone's like, oh, like, because, you know, everyone's like, oh, does he speak Japanese? What should we do? And so, you know, I think just being able to like say, hey, I speak Japanese, we could talk, all that kind of stuff just made everything a lot easier. So it was cool. Yeah. That's pretty funny, though. Who broke the ice? It was me, guys. It was like, like just one of those, like, just for that whole story is like, when everyone knows, how did they all become friends? And then you're standing there. Well, I'm sure everyone will remember that because it was super awkward in that room. We were all just in there 
not a word being spoken. And after like, I don't know, three, five minutes of that, I was just like, okay, forget this. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And then after that, it was all fine. Yeah. All right. So I got to ask you probably the most asked question to any tokusatsu actor that has ever worked on Godzilla, Gamera, Ultraman, because yeah. at every G Fest, actors are asked this question. Mm -hmm. Because most of the stunts are filmed on a separate location soundstage as a second unit. How often do you actually get the chance to actually see them film some of the stuff that goes on into making it? Oh, uh, anytime you want. I mean, we were filming in the other soundstage from where they were filming all those fights and the main thing. So if, you know, if we weren't on and we had a break, we could go and watch them, you know, fight, watch Ultraman fighting the the kaiju on the, you know, the, the tokusatsu set. So it was, it was super cool. All right. I'm just, I was about to try to go Google searches and double check, but I'm just going to ask you because you probably have a better memory. Iwata was not Ultraman Max at that time, correct? Iwata started taking over a little afterwards, right? As yeah, no, no, yeah. He, right. Because he was a yeah. secondary uh, suit actor that I know they had for movies. And then pretty much at Tsuburaya, he's like their version of Seiji Takaiwa. He's like yeah. every time there's a new Ultimate series, it's him in the suit. Iwata. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. What's funny is uh, he has a thing like DM me for uh, booking inquiries. I just want to put this out there as a funny thing. I remember he had like actually in English, like, you know, DM for booking. And so like I DM'd him and like I never got it. Like it just like just see it. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, so... I'm guessing he like only meant Japanese people. Like, Maybe, like, but... I'm like, I'm one of those guys. Like, I'm like, all right, I'll go get it translated then. So I, I just haven't done it yet, but I just wanted to bring up that funny story of like, he had it like on a social media for a while for bookings and stuff. So I'm like, I'll interview this guy if I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, I mean, all those suit actors, you know, they're they're kind of um, they they live in their own world. You know, I, I mean, Tsuburaya has a great. I don't know if people know this or if it's even a secret, but they, they have this really great mechanism of bringing people in, training them up and then letting them be, you know, suit actors, you know, so there, there's a, there's this whole kind of like stable of these guys and, you know, they're all, they're all aspiring to be, you know, great suit actors and, you know, the ones that are on the show are kind of like one branch and then there's the ones who are, on the live shows, you know, when they do the live stage shows with the Ultraman versus the Kaiju and, and like what we do on Ultraman Connection, you know, those guys are a totally different branch. So, you know, you kind of have to pick which one you want to do because the the fine details of each one are, are very different. You know, they kind of look like they're all doing the same thing, but it's it's very it's very different training um, to be filmed on, you know, on, on, the, on a set versus fighting a kaiju on a on a live stage in front of an audience right so and 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 they're really cool and you know you get to know them all very well you know you they, they you they see you a lot more than you see them because their faces are always covered but uh but you know once you get to know who's who then you're always like oh yeah you hey how's it going that kind of stuff yeah all right this all is a question i just came up with on the fly since you were yeah. able to go visit when they were filming like the stunts and yeah. actions was there ever days because i i know with uh hearing it from power ranger actors there'll be times that like you'll be filming you know a couple of episodes a day or scenes per day was there ever a time where like you were reading the script and then you'd go over there and watch them and like be so disjointed of knowing which episode they were filming versus which episodes you were filming kind of ordeal and then you'd get home and watch it and be like oh so that's what that was a reference to all the time every second every, because you know we always practice and rehearse our scenes right and the the action scenes in the in the script, you know, there's a little bit of detail, but not a lot. You know, you know, we have our very detailed lines and things like that. And it'll say, you know, Ultraman Max battles Eddie King and Eddie King uses his electricity. But then Ultraman color timer starts counting down. So Ultraman defeats him with the spacium beam or whatever Ultraman beam was. And uh, and that's it. So you don't know the details about like how he throws him into a building or what, you know, what part of Tokyo gets destroyed, you know, these kinds of things. So you don't know that kind of stuff. So when you're watching it, you're just kind of like, I have no idea what part of the the the, the show this is. But 
but you kind of know because the the monster you always know which kaiju you're fighting so you can kind of see that and go like okay that's episode whatever and so you kind of know that that much at least just because of that yeah because max also had like a lot of new kaiju so for i was i had to ask this because i'm like expecting like one day you're like oh hey reading the script and it says luganogre and you're like i don't remember that kaiju and then here's yeah. Luganoger with his dragon with his two dinosaur hand like things. And you're just like, yeah. the hell is that? And they're like, that's Luganoger. And you're just like, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Like, just like, yeah. like, I just imagine like you doing like episode one and five and then they're already on like seven or something. Oh, no, no. They, they, they do it very strictly. They, they film only two at a, two episodes at okay. a time. So it, in America, we have this issue of like, people say they'll shoot all of the day scenes for episodes like one, three, five, and then yeah, not yeah, know yeah. which episode they just filmed. Right. So because blurs. because like what I was saying before, the directors do two at a time. Mm -hmm. So you really never will go outside of those two episodes. Sometimes you'll be filming episode one and episode two on the same day. So you kind of have to keep those two things straight. But you'll never be like one, two and episode 10 on the same day because it's just a completely different director. And um, that would be uh, impossible, right? Because they couldn't do it. Yeah. All right. Uh, another question I had was uh, during the filming, what mm -hmm. did you find to be like the most difficult shooting days like prefer preferably like i guess like when it was like episodes or just stunts like because i know like i said i i'm always used to american style of like they break it up into oh we have to do all of our interiors and exteriors so since you guys yeah. say you only film two at a time what did you either what episodes when filming did you find to be like the most uh yeah artists like either mo more retakes or you you messed up a stunt yeah the the, the hardest the most grueling days were the hot, hot summer days in, in Japan, where the humidity is like at 100% and it's almost like 100 degrees outside and you're wearing, you know, you're wearing this leather suit and a helmet and the sweat is just pouring down, um, you know, and we had we had boots on, right? So the sweat would actually just run down the inside of this leather suit all the way down into our boots. So when we took off our boots, we could literally dump the sweat out of our boot after we took it off. So that was that was hard. Um, you know, we don't really have a lot of like, you know, I don't, I don't really have a lot of like stories about how the director's like, oh, do another take of this, do another take of that. I mean, sometimes you'd mess up and do something funny and then everyone would laugh, but it wasn't like, you know, you never got to like take 60 of something just because the director wanted, you know, to get that real like detailed part. I remember one of one of the ones that took the longest though was um, there's this really cool scene when when Eddie, the robot, actually cries. So, you know, as an actor, crying on cue is is hard sometimes. But we had to get the tear to come exactly down, like a like it had to be a robotic tear. So you know we had you know because robots don't cry. I mean this is kind of a silly story that why does the robot cry? But it's kind of like her development to becoming more human, right? Was that she cried and like to get that tear to come directly down and to get her to cry on cue and uh, time and time again took a while. But that was you know that was just really not because. Uh, Hikari-chan was doing a bad job. It was just because it, it had to be perfect, you know, each time. So that was it. All right. Uh, the last question I have for, I guess, Max related, and then I'll let Sound Out uh, talk for like the next bulk, is what were your opinions of the show when it was airing versus now looking back at it? Like, mm -hmm. like what was your thoughts with it? You know, yeah. like to the whole the whole phenomenon of it airing and then looking back, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was just really exciting to watch the show every week when it was when it was broadcast. Right, because we didn't get a chance to really see it. We, we didn't see it until it was literally on the TV in our living room, you know, being broadcast. So it was always kind of really exciting to see, oh, that's how they turned that into the whole story or that's how they did that you know especially around the tokusatsu shooting because you know you, you got to see how that like all integrates into the the full the full story um so that's sort of where i was you know at the time it was out i was just really excited every week when it would come out and i you know i'd record it and watch it again and again and, and show my friends and show my family and that kind of thing so that was kind of fun 
But I think now it just surprises me, even after 16 years, how many people have reached out to me and said, oh, I love Max. That was one of my favorite. You know, I, it, it, it really is a lot of people's favorite series. You know, obviously, like Seven and the original Ultraman and, you know, some of the newer, you know, uh, Tiga got, you know, th those kinds of things that people like that. But Max is kind of randomly placed kind of in the middle of all these and for it to stand out that much, even with people, it's it's kind of, it, it, it really is uh, something that on one hand, it surprises me, but on the other hand, it's kind of like that was the plan. It was to make this something that everyone would like, and it would just be something different and stand out around in, in the crowd, you know, for that time. Yeah, uh, I think that's a great response, because I was like, I always know there's some actors that I seen interviews with, and heck, we uh, recently provided a transcript for people who couldn't go to uh g fest and an actor mm -hmm. said at the time of filming one of the godzilla movies they're like oh it's just a godzilla movie it's not yeah, it's yeah. just everyone's just gonna say it's okay and then they're like oh i didn't realize that even though this was like the last of the show era where godzilla in japan had like tapered off they didn't realize that like just the story and the context of what went on in tower of mecha godzilla would actually mm -hmm. resonate with a lot of people going for a send-off for the show era a lot of people really love tower of mecha godzilla so the actress was like I didn't I didn't realize that this character became such a phenomenon and it's mm. you know community the people it's made for you know the yeah the tokusatsu fans she was like I'm I'm really pleased she was like when I made it she was like I, I liked the role I liked the movie I didn't think it was great because it was a Godzilla movie and at the time they weren't like but like looking back because I, I I know you I was like he's got probably gonna be like oh it's been the same versus like you know if I ask mm. another actor from say another show or even co-star they're gonna be like well there was a while where I was like why did I choose Max it typecast me or something it, it, yeah, did, yeah, it yeah. did the opposite of being the launch pad because I hear how in Japan for a lot of startups if you're on say like Ultraman or Kamen Rider it may kickstart your career even if you're in Sentai or it may just be you're done yeah it's yeah like, your and and I think I think the you're done um happens more than it does, especially the Toei. Especially yeah. for Toei. If you are not yeah. able to market, uh if you're not able to be multiversal, whether it be a, be an actor or an actual mm -hmm. model or yeah. uh just do something else variety wise, it's like you're out. You're yeah. done. I mean, but you know, on 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 Max, right? Uh, the the actress who played Eddie, right? Yeah, she, uh, she went Mitsushima Hikari has become the the biggest actress actor in Japan. You know, she's she's huge, amazing, and it's just like really cool. And you know, the 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 guy who played uh, the the captain um, uh, Shishido Kai, you know, he, you know, he's he's the son of a really famous actor in Japan, but he's also gone on to do a lot of great things too. So it's um it's been a really cool cast to be a part of, you know, there's, uh, it's not like, you know, it's just, we did Max and then we've been completely forgotten. You know, there's, there's some people in that cast who have gone on to do really great things. Yeah. yeah I mean, you got, uh, Sota, who was, like I said, right after oh, or during yeah. he did death note and he did, he, he, note, did yeah. he did the two live actions, the first two that were, you know, uh, a really short compilation of like the first arc where he gets to pretty much kill kill Kira, yep. who's an, whose actor is another big actor in Japan. Um, and then he was brought back for that Light Up the World movie that came out like six or seven years ago, which was like an anniversary to those live action films. Yeah. Only yeah. they get killed off in the first act because he survived <laughs> the first two films. Ha ha, yeah. I survived. Yeah, no yeah. you don't. Now you're dead. Yep. <laughs> oh God, I have a weird feeling you get a message and be like, hey, I have a guy who's been talking about you. <laughs> and he's gonna be like, those Americans. Yeah, no, no, it's good. It's uh, I, I don't know why, but Death Note really popped off. Like, well, it popped off in Japan, but it really was a huge mm. thing in America here for a long time. Yes, yes. It was very huge. But uh, Sound Out, uh, you're going to pick up everything after Max now. Yep. Okay. So, uh, you know, we, we know we know that you're doing Ultraman Connection now, but between Max and Ultraman Connection, um, you know, did you do any other productions? What was kind of your... Where, where'd your career go between between these yeah. two benchmarks yeah, it, was, it was kind of interesting so i um i you know the whole time that i was doing sort of my acting career in japan i was also like holding down you know a regular full-time job at the same time so 
Um, once I sort of got, you know, this experience working sort of in front of the camera, I was also trying to learn things about behind the camera, like not necessarily being a director, but more about production and content creation. And I've spent pr pretty much the, that, the, the post max career doing a lot of this, uh, you know, it was sort of the revolution of the digital online video. So, you know, YouTube became a thing and I, I worked at YouTube and I was helping YouTube creators sort of expand their presence um, globally through collaborations or other brand things. And then I started working for Amazon Prime Video. And then when that launched in Japan, I was helping out with them, uh, you know, creating new content for the Japanese audience or bringing content like, I don't know, do you know the show The Bachelor? You know, we brought that over from the US and, and, and made that into a Japanese version. So things like that. And, and now I work, um, uh, you know, not only with Tsuburaya on content creation, but I also work with creators in Japan to help just sort of um, bolster the this thing called the creator economy, right? Which is this, you know, there's a, it's over a hundred billion dollars in the, uh, in this creator economy. And there's so many opportunities now. There's so many platforms, there's so many ways to monetize. And uh, that's sort of where my career is kind of, uh, led me. So now I'm doing a lot more of a, like, you know, uh, content creation, content strategy, content production, these kinds of things are where I'm, I'm doing most of my, my jobs these days. And along the way, I'm helping uh, companies who want to come into Japan. Um, you know, I, I am an advisor for many companies, you know, like similar to Tsuburaya, I'm an advisor for Tsuburaya on how to take Ultraman out of Japan in, in you know, in, into the U.S., and and that's how Ultraman Connection was was founded. You know, it was it it happened in a really funny way. I was working on a book of to uh, to celebrate Ultraman Max's fifteenth anniversary. Okay, so we all the cast got to you know got interviewed, and they were going to write one chapter for each of the each of the cast, and. Um, one of the the PR people from Tsuburaya was there watching to make sure he didn't say anything, you know, really bad. And, you know, I knew her from way back when Ultraman Max, she was like a new hire, just fresh out of college. And now she's like the head of PR for Tsuburaya. So it was really funny to see her growth over that time. And when she heard that I was doing this, you know, kind of work about helping um, Japanese companies, you know, expand to the U.S. and vice versa. She was like, "Oh my gosh, you need to come talk to our international division because the the rights issues for Ultraman have now been totally fixed, and now we can start. We've started promoting. We've got a whole plan on how we're going to promote um, in the U.S. And I was kind of telling you earlier, one of the you know, of course, there's the the TV series and the movies and things like that. But also the live stage shows are a huge part of bringing Ultraman to the masses. Um, and it's, it's very impactful, especially for the, for the kids. They love to see the, the monsters in real, real life get you know, destroyed by the Ultraman. But because- I also love those inflatable ones too. Those inflatable oh, oh. ones really, really are a driving point. Yes. But here's the problem. There was this thing, this little thing called Corona that, that hit us and obviously you can't do uh, you can't get a group of 500 people together to watch a stage show so we were like okay what are we going to do and it's like well why don't we do a live stream show that way everyone in the world can see it and like okay that's good um but who's going to be the MC? and then everyone in the room kind of looked at me and be like hey why don't you do it sean and i'm like all right let's do it and then so that's how um ultraman connection live started um, we've been doing it for a whole year now. So, you know, we do it every month and uh, hopefully everyone who's watching this will go out and, and sign up to ultramanconnection.com. It's a free, you know, it's free to sign up. You there's, there's all kinds of information about Ultraman. You can watch episodes, you can watch the live show. Um, there, there's some, some content is paid, some content is free, but anyway, it's just, the, it's a great place to kind of sign up to know what's coming out next and get that information firsthand. It's and that was completely sponsored for this video. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's all good. I mean, we're, I, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm helping them because we want to increase the fan base in Japan or sorry, in Japan, in the U S but 
really, I just want to, I just want to throw all the love I can for that I have for Ultraman to everyone else and, and let them come in because it's been so long. I mean, it's been decades since people have been able to, to legally, I guess, um, see Ultraman in the U.S. So this is, this is a really, a really good step. So going from that, um, you know, we, so you've had these different streams. Have you ever, you know, you know, sometimes in preparation, have you gone back to watch other shows and have you ended up becoming friends with any of the actors that weren't from your series, but just came on to the Ultraman connection events? Of course. And this is, this is the greatest part because the thing about Ultraman series is they're so, you know, you're so tied up into the series that you're in. And they're so different from one series to the next that you never really get to spend any time with the other actors in the other series. And we all want to, but we just don't have the time. So this is really cool because now all those people who are guests on the show, I, you know, I saw them on their show, but I never got to interact with them. So it's really cool now to meet them and, you know, and ever, ever we'll, we'll, we'll meet, I'll get their information. We'll go out drinking or we'll have a, you know, we'll have, we'll go out to dinner or, you know, whatever, just do some stuff together. And it's, it's really cool. So like you said, it's, it's a, uh, it's a really good experience for me because I get to see all these folks that I never would have had a chance to. Oh, I have one question on production side for the Ultraman yeah. Connection streams. Are they actually live or are they taped then broadcast live? Because I've noticed mm. sometimes when you guys do like the questions, they feel very generated by the staff working on the streams rather than like the questions from like the chat. I've, I've There's always been like a weird disconnect. I don't know if it's because of the stream or is it because of the, the broadcast? How, how does that work yeah. when you guys are doing the show? Okay, so I can explain that. So um, first of all, it's all live. Everything Everything is straight through. Now, sometimes during the stream, there are so many questions that come in that we can't like actually read them because they're going so fast. So what we started doing is in advance on Twitter, we said, if you have any questions that you want to ask, tweet them here, and then we'll ask them during the show. So the ones that kind of sound like staff generated are probably ones coming from Twitter rather than the ones coming from the, uh, the show. Now, in some of the shows, they actually let me have a computer right in front of me so I can actually see the people writing. Um, and, and now that we're using discord instead of the, like the, the chat that's like in the video, like in the video stream. Yeah. That's actually a problem. The yeah. discord chat actually will bog down the stream sometimes because it's trying to update so fast and it's another uh, service and discord yeah. actually already eats bandwidth. I've tested it. I've had uh, discord on while talking with friends. And it actually is a bandwidth eater for some people where it oh, kind of cancels oh, each other. On the, on the local side. Yeah, and if you can't and if you can't turn it off, your stream might start chugging and you might be uh, behind. Yeah, but yeah, good. the reason I wanted to ask that was there's been times where I'm watching these and they almost feel like you guys taped it and then aired it, even though it's you know, it's live live because some of the questions I'm just like, did someone at Super Eyes say we gotta ask these ones specifically? Cause I've always wondered like the pick and choose. Cause like some of them where you guys don't say this was um, given to us by user, you know, uh, 584, you know, example here. Right. It, it feels, it, it, that's why I wanted to bring that up. Cause I, I've always just sat there going, I'm like, man, these questions sound like just your typical, like ones that you'll see on the website where it's like right. the, where like, you know, we're introducing the new show. And then like, it's those bios that like Ultraman connection puts out. Like what was your thoughts of Ultraman? What was the first time, you know, yeah, yeah. and like then the actors are on the on the gun having to make it up because they're either too young or yeah, never yeah, even yeah. watched it. So well, okay, so uh, that the thing about saying who asked the question, actually, I remember that debate happening. Um, some people on the Tsuburaya side were saying, "Oh, we don't want to, you know, it's personal information, so we don't want to say the person's name in case I don't, they." Don't I think if you use if you use their Twitter handle, just the handle that, at. That, yeah, that's exactly my my thought too, and. Yeah. But but then then they said to me, well, but if it's at, you know, A B C D one two three five seven nine, you know, it's like yeah, that doesn't no, mean yeah yeah. There. You could just you could just ignore those ones. But it's like, for example, if I write in, it's going to say at yeah. wheelchair twenty one. You know, yeah, you want it, you want it, you want that to come out, and want, that's my want, point. Yeah, yeah, some people like because like I remember you guys would do the questions, and sometimes they would actually be people, and you wouldn't say the ads, but then everyone in the chat would be like, yo, that's mine, that's mine, and yeah. you know. 
because I remember one time I had asked like this question and nothing was going on in the chat. This was before we switched over to Discord. Nothing was going on. And I felt like the Subaraya guys didn't want you to answer my quest ask oh, my question. Because yeah. it was there. No one has talked, no one even submitted any more questions. And the one question that I had was for Ultraman Agul's uh actor, which was what's it like being one of the few people on the show that's been in multiple tokusatsus as a hero and villain yeah, and yeah, right. i think they didn't want to answer and have that question asked it felt like they didn't want to because there was a uh, part where you were talking to him yeah and like i remember he said common rider and i remember mm. like you and i think uh oh, maria oh, maria oh. both looked at the the executive and you both looked and were like uh oh he said he said the forbidden words yeah, I remember that. Yes, that was. Oh, a thing. I need to know. I need to know. Is that like a? <laughs> is that a no no? Can you not ask other actors about going off and doing other projects? Yes, they don't like that. They don't like they don't, that at okay. all. Okay, no, yeah. that's good. That's good because I <laughs> I kept saying to myself this this has to be a thing that they said you can't do because the fact that my comment sat there and I'm yeah. like no one's actually asking any questions. It's like everyone wanted that question asked, even yep. in the chat. And I was like, yo, they are censoring me because I asked the forbid I asked to open the forbidden door. I, I that's think I think that's the thing too, because I know that um there was uh there was a live event for Zen that Toei did. Mm -hmm. And um was it Ultraman Di it wasn't Ultraman Dinah's actor yes, singing. Yes, Dinah's actor, yes, he was singing. And then he, he does the Ultraman pose at the event. <laughs> and then there was a bunch of there was a bunch of people like like you could see it on the actual like video, the press conference of like there was like a producer that like came in and talked to him. Oh, <laughs> like off to the side it was just like you, you can't actually <laughs> yeah so so okay so it's like in wrestling it's a forbidden door because i don't exactly. know if you're i don't know if you are i know in japan pro wrestling and baseball are huge there but mm -hmm. you know the term forbidden door is like if another company and them don't work together it's like and then they start working oh. together they call that the forbidden door and yeah. so i i feel like because i even said to myself during that stream i kept saying and saying i was in a group chat with all my friends we're all watching it live together and we're on skype and i'm like answer the question and i'm just like I, and everyone's just like yeah no one's typing yeah. no one's even asking anything else you're the only question in the chat right now and they're yeah. like answer it like and i would have just liked if someone in the chat had just said yo we, we can't mention we're not yeah. legally allowed to we'd like to but we can't i i wish i knew no, that's was all right. like, don't worry nobody 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 cares that but much but but now you guys know you, yes. you can't open the forbidden door live exactly. on stream don't open the forbidden door oh one ip at a time please yeah exactly yeah. that means hero club will have to go out reach out to agle's actor and be like yo yeah yeah, yeah tell yeah. us about being ask him directly when it's not ask on a sponsored directly. event right exactly when it's not a sponsored exactly. event that's exactly what we need to do yeah. that'd be like me trying to ask uh Gamu's actor, who was uh, Gaia, what was it like being in one episode of Cutie Honey the Live? Mm -hmm. You know? So, know. M moving back to our, our regularly scheduled questions about Ultraman yes. Connection. Um, so, out of all the Ultraman Connection streams, which has been your favorite? But mm. you can't say the Max one, because we're pretty sure that's your favorite. Dang, because that was my <laughs> so favorite out, one. Outside of Max, which one was your favorite to do? Hmm. I think it was the one where um, Kurobe-san and Sakurai-san, the two original, the Ultraman original actor and actress, the hero and heroine came back um, because, you know, they were in Max too. So it was really cool to catch up with them again. I mean, they're getting, uh, I mean, obviously they're, they're getting older. So it's great, you know, to get any time you can with them uh, because, it's precious at this stage. Um, you know, Sakurai song is is just, I don't know if you know the Japanese word genki, but it means like just super happy and healthy and like out there. And, you know, she's one of the most genki people I know in the whole world. And uh, she's doing great. And so I see her a lot, but I don't see Kurobe san so much anymore, but it was really good to see both of them and, you know, interact with them. And, you know, Kurobe san such a funny guy. You know, he's got this dry sense of humor where like uh after you know it was it's been like maybe 15 years since i've seen him so when he got there i walked into the i walked into his dressing room and i'm like oh kurobe san it's been so long how are you doing and he's like he's like who are you and, and it was just a joke right and i'm like wait you don't remember <laughs> you don't remember me and he's like no i know who you are silly but 
you know, that kind of joke is, is like what I should have expected from him, but, uh, but it was, it was great. It was great to see those guys. So um, yeah, that was probably my favorite. I remember that stream well because like every minute you weren't uh managing them when answering questions they started yeah. like ribbing each other or like just <laughs> joking because I remember there was a part where like Kurobe just like started tearing into Bin Faria and and uh oh that's God. right Bean Sun was on there too yeah yeah. Bin... yeah 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 another guy we interviewed too so check that out <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, no, yeah. I just remember they were riveted because I remember there was a thing where I think it was either him and uh, Fuji's actress. I, I always forget her last name. Uh, Sakurai, Sakurai. Sakurai. Sakurai saw they were both uh, making a rib at what it was either at Bin or <laughs> yeah, I yeah, say, yeah. well, you're the oldest, so you should die first. And I'm like, <laughs> and, and I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah, and then they yeah. were at it. And which is funny, though, because I find out that that's actually a joke they do at like every panel. Because uh, a friend of okay. mine went to another panel of theirs in America. Mm -hmm. And supposedly they just like pointing out who's the oldest there and like just ribbing them, which, you know, I find funny. Um, well, it's actually not, not funny, but it's one of those weird coincidences that I find it interesting that when it comes to uh, the Subaraya actors, a mm -hmm. lot of their main titular protagonist actors, at least, uh, they're actually quite well and still good health compared to other yeah. franchise. Like, like there have been a actor alumni who have unfortunately passed on and have died in in who have acted mm -hmm. on Ultraman yep. but it's really interesting to have you know your lead actor still among us versus yeah. other yeah. other main titular shows like I know there's like Common Rider there have been metal heroes like the the actual titular star have unfortunately passed away either due to illness mm -hmm. uh accidents and whatnot but it's it's still very interesting and intriguing I find it always like a blessing and a curse like it's like my God, they're they're still fine. And then other yeah. days I'll be like, oh man, he doesn't look so good. And it's like, no. Oh. And you know, in Beansan, even he, they used his body mm -hmm. to, uh, for the CG model on Sheen Ultraman the movie. So I mean, that just tells you how like in shape uh, he yeah. is now. Even so, um, it's 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 really it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, Did no. you guys, have you guys seen Sheen Ultraman yet, by the way? No, we still haven't. Um, oh. A friend of mine kept trying to egg me to go down to the city to go to the, to the, uh, what do you call it? The, the, the theater the film festival. The film festival to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, it was like so short notice that it was announced there that it was like, I couldn't, even though I'm like 90 minutes away, to, you know, two hours was like. Yeah, well, the, I, the closest I, uh... it's shown for me is like several states away hasn't gotten yeah. anywhere close enough i think well I, I i worked on the uh i i did the english subtitles so okay you know, if, they're, if they're bad blame me if, all right if everyone you like them, get ready if you like them please tell me but uh yeah anyway so it was good it was a hard movie it's a hard movie to do um but, yeah, i noticed uh, there was a lot of on-screen text in a lot yeah. of the trailers yeah that 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 is an onoism that's for sure that is such yep. a yeah, yeah. onoism yeah, we're ho hopefully hopefully the Toho and Subaru get the movie out to more things than yeah. just some more events because I'd like to see it. It's just yeah. hasn't, hasn't Sean, come up yet. Most of our spoilers for the movie have been because they keep announcing new toys, not because of, uh, trailers or visuals. Yeah. It's the oh, toys. Well, it's always that's always it because you know yeah. uh, Bondi needs to know everything so they can make the toy so it's ready to go. Um, and Bandai is the one that always leak, you know, it always leaks from them. They're the one. I, I don't know how uh, Tsuburai has not gotten mad at them because they're the ones that are always leaking the problem. Um, but anyway, yeah. Yeah, we've we've noticed things where like Bandai will just like here here Ultraman Decker sword, and then it like yeah. scans triggers hyper keys, and then Tsuburai is like, all right, fine, triggers in Decker. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I think one of the more interesting ones was how we found out about Zofi was the movie just came out in Japan and not even a lot of people who even seen it spoiled it online. It was Bandai like right as soon as theaters opened in Japan we're like, SH Fig Arts, Zofi, black and gold. And we're uh, like, so, okay. I, I don't want to do a huge spoiler alert here with, uh, with, with Zofi, mm -hmm. but how should I say this? That Zofi is not the same Zofi that you know and love. Let's okay, so I'm ge I'm Ooh. guessing it's the other spoiler that we already know. I will say it for the people watching this if we get this yeah. video out before. But yeah, okay. The spelling the spelling is slightly different, so it's a different uh, person. So that was okay. intentional. Did that someone work? say Ultraman Chuck? Yes. 
so <laughs> as as a fellow Chuck fan, uh, yes. I I wanted to ask uh, when you were going to to voice uh, Chuck for the English dub of the Destin Crossroad. Yeah, uh, did you go back and look at the previous voices of Chuck for any kind of inspiration as to how his voice should sound? You know, I know this is such like a cliche thing to say, but I didn't. All right, because I wanted it to be. I didn't want to have any sort of like. I, it's not that I didn't want to have a reference point, but I just didn't want to be a copy of the old Chuck. So I just went to the director and I said, you know, tell me everything you can about Chuck and let me come up with the voice myself. And that's kind of that's kind of what happened. So um, I don't know if I actually I don't know how much I ended up sounding like the original Chuck. But if I did, um, it, it's because the director did a great job of explaining to me what Chuck should sound like. But I uh, I did not go back and look and and, and watch the old show to see yeah all right and um and going with that you were you just approached to voice chuck where they're like hey would you like to voice an ultraman in destin crossover was there any more complicated process than that um no it was pretty easy it was kind of like you know hey uh we we need someone to do chuck and would you like to do it i was like yes i would let's do it and so that's how it worked uh you know in in the other guys that in, in girls who were doing the voice of, of the other characters. I, I, I know like 80% of them just because, you know, it's kind of a small community here in Japan. So it was kind of, it was kind of cool to get in the studio and work with all those guys again. And, and, you know, I know the director also uh, from just being around and uh, he's a great guy. Uh, you know, he speaks English fluently. So it's always fun working with him too. He's a, he's a good guy to work with. All right. Wonderful. Um, so thank you for your time today. We appreciate uh, all the wonderful answers to the questions we've been giving you. Sure. And we'd let's, absolutely let's love to do again. another one of these. This was fun. I'm, all, yeah. I'm always open. Let, let's uh, let's have a part two. Yeah, yeah man. absolutely. We have we have plenty more questions we can ask. We didn't get to talk about Anime Expo yet. We can talk oh, about yeah. all kinds of stuff. Um, Hell, we can maybe we can talk, talk about the multiverse. You. We can even do the multiverse, which caused our problem because we took the break. We're like, well, no one's going to care about us discussing the multiverse. That's probably the biggest problem, the multiverse. Yes. Well, it's not just a problem for Subaraya. It's a problem for us. It's a very long discussion, but it is. we appreciate your time and we appreciate you coming in and talking to us. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to do a part two soon. Yes, not a problem. Thank you guys so much. All right. All right everyone go check out Ultraman Connection and thank go you. check out Hero Club. And I think that'll pretty much wrap it up. So yeah. thank you all for tuning in. And thank you, Sean, for coming and talking with us. And Ooh. We'll be we'll be hopefully doing another one of these again. Okay. Thank you, Hero Club. Thanks everybody for watching. Take care.